All right, everyone. Welcome to the Node.js meetup. We do this uh, every single month on the third Thursday. Um, before we get into the talk, uh, I want to um, welcome anybody to you know who has announcements. This could be if you have if you you know are hiring and you need to hire somebody, or if you're you're looking to get hired, um, um, or if you just have anything that you'd like to say to the community. So I'm going to open it up for uh, for all of you. All right, going once, going twice. All right. Um, well, uh, we are recording this talk, so it'll be available on YouTube uh, shortly afterwards. Um, I do have to basically process it, upload it to YouTube, so it'll probably be, you know, at least by the end of the weekend. I will put a link to that in the uh, meetup um, comments, uh, and also I'll, I'll tweet it out and put a, uh, a link in Denver Devs, the meetup channel. Uh, so if you want to find the link to it, one of those locations is where you can go. Of course, if you're watching the VOD afterwards, uh, well, you, you found it already. So congratulations. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce you uh, to our speaker tonight. Um, so Kyle Bernhardi, as the CTO of HarperDB, um, he has 20 years of industry experience, uh, including 10 years of high availability distributed computing. Um, and uh, he has three patents in data management. Um, he's also an expert in cloud architecture as well as multiple programming languages. And uh, I've been told that uh, he's been doing a lot of uh, baking of sourdough and uh, biking, you know, really fast, absolutely nowhere. Uh, and so without any further uh, ado, I will hand it over to you, Kyle. Awesome. Thank you, Brooks. I appreciate it. Um, yes, uh, having a bike at home has been real helpful uh, during this time uh, without being able to go to a gym. Um, so I really appreciate everyone showing up tonight, uh, giving me some of your time. Um, so let me share my screen. Awesome. Um, cool. So like Brooke said, I'm Kyle Bernhardy. I'm a CTO and co-founder at HarperDB. Um, and so tonight I'm going to talk a bit about uh, distributed computing, a bit about WebSockets, a bit about how we fit in that uh, HarperDB fits in that, why we um, chose to have a distributed architecture for our database system. Um, also talk obviously about what is socket cluster, how did socket cluster help facilitate us in uh, distributed computing and distributed storage. And then um, I have a big chunk of doing uh, a code overview. And so what I did for tonight uh, was I created a sample project rather than boring people with abstract code snippets from our project, I thought it would be more tangible to actually Give a project for people that they can, you know, debug, play with on their own, expand upon, just to explore Socket Cluster further in their own time if you choose. So I'll share that link in the chat um, in a bit. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's do this. So a um, little bit about HarperDB. Um, we started a little bit over three years ago. Um, we're a net new database built from the ground up. Uh, we're a structured object store with SQL capabilities, meaning that you could do a NoSQL insert and or uh, SQL insert updates. You can do a mix of NoSQL operations and SQL operations. Uh, and you can, it's a single model, meaning that we don't duplicate that data, transform it in order to execute J, uh, SQL against your JSON records. Um, they're all distilled down into a single model that then is uh, queryable and mutatable through SQL or NoSQL. Um, 
And then obviously what we're talking about tonight is uh, our advanced pub sub data replication. So that's where we come into the distributed um, data replication. Um, and so when you look at our architectural overview, we have a lot of components. We have a REST API, we have SQL, we have NoSQL, we have drivers, um, and we have WebSocket here, which is another communication protocol that we've implemented. And it's specifically used for different nodes of HarperDB to share data between each other and share the uh, schema metadata. And then forward looking, it'll also be expanded into distributed operations like NoSQL, SQL, and so then spreading out uh, the querying capability. So rather than distributing and deterministically sharing data, to also be able to uh, across your cluster execute queries deterministically against maybe node four or node five, uh, things like that. Um, and so also, like Brooks had mentioned, um, HarperDB is written in Node.js. Um, and we chose Node.js. Um, one, uh, it was what we knew. Uh, and the easiest way to start a new project is to use what you know. Uh, and also with starting a new company and all the challenges and fun things and all the things that are on your plate, learning a new language on top of that it just adds a lot of stress. We had a lot of experience with Node.js from uh, previous companies. We had a lot of experience in scaling it out uh, for high availability. Uh, so we felt very comfortable taking on this project in Node. And also the community has been a huge benefit to us. There's a massive, as I'm sure everyone here knows, NPM is the largest uh, library network on the planet. Um, and so, it's almost like when you're looking for a solution, what do you choose, not how do I figure out what I want to use. Um, so distributed computing, um, I'm not going to read this whole blurb from Wikipedia. I'll let you guys read that as I move on. But um, for us, we have individual instances of HarperDB running on separate uh, VMs, separate servers, maybe a Raspberry Pi over here, and then a, a supercomputer up in the cloud. It could be any distributed manner of nodes. Some might be behind firewalls. They can only talk up to the server and the server can't talk down uh, with really complex topologies. Uh, and so being able to create that communication there that can handle all these different topologies really required something um, mean and flexible. Um, and so I'm going to take you a little bit on our journey of what we did to get to Socket Cluster. Um, but just to talk a little bit more about how we you or how we are distributed, um, our assumption is at any point in time, a node can be offline. And that's obvious, right? Like you may be uh, talking back and forth from a, uh, a blade that's right next to you, and that one blade might go down. Uh, and so if you're relying on the data from that other blade, your work is going to fail. Um, but even in, say, something like robotics, um, where if the robot is always expecting to talk to the cloud to de decide what to do, um, that network's going to go down. The cloud might have an outage. And once that's done, then that robot is out of work. Um, so our intention with HarperDB is to always expect offline and to allow catch up once the network or the, you know, the connecting nodes come back online. So that means each node needs to be its own cache, needs to be able to handle its own uh, message brokering uh, and also handle its own pub sub um, and security between the nodes as well. We looked at things like RabbitMQ, uh, that's too heavyweight, um, where we needed to have like a central server. And again, that broke our paradigm where if there are nodes that can't talk to that, um, that message broker, then we failed at that point. Because um, we really want to be able to accommodate our clients and make it easy for them, not make it so that they have to accommodate our technology. Um, so just talking a little bit about network topologies, um, just to put in context a little bit what I'm talking about. So over on the left, you have a more simple uh, topology where it's a wheel, you usually have a man in the middle and people or other nodes are pushing data to that node in the middle. That is a typical edge topology. 
um, where you've got a lot of little computers collecting data and then pushing that up to say the cloud or a knock or something like that. Um, you could also have a chain um, where you're just pushing data in a line uh, or pushing it around uh, a circle or much more complex, everyone's talking to everyone and everyone's sharing everything to everyone. And these are all topologies that we do and wanted to accommodate. Um, and you can also think about one of these lines talking to one node. Um, so let's think about that wheel node in the upper left hand corner. All those edge nodes could be behind a firewall that the server is unaware um, of the can't hit the IP of those edge nodes, but the edge nodes can reach out. Um, and so using something like WebSockets where it's a duplex connection, that really helps us be able to overcome that limitation. Because um, if we're required for to have a back and forth, um, but the server can't push down to those nodes that are behind the firewall, again, we've lost. Um, so what did we try when we first wanted to achieve uh, distributed computing with HarperDB, having data be shared between nodes? Um, like everyone else, we tried Socket.io, uh, and we embedded Socket.io logic into uh, our parent process. So we used the cluster library um, to have all of our parallel processes run embarrassingly parallel so that we can scale out um, HarperDB um, and make it more available. Um, but we put the parent, the socket IO logic in the parent process at the time. We thought that was a good idea because everyone would just communicate up to the parent uh, and then the parent uh, could then distribute the data out across the cluster. Um, we also had some issues with data, uh, the way we were storing our data um, for every node that was connected. We had a separate store for that node. So that node had its own catch up um, stream rather than a centralized stream that worked off of a time-based uh, manner per table. Um, and also that distributed logic was tightly coupled into our core logic. And again, it was our first try and you learn a lot through that first try so that you can then uh, move on and have greater success. And so what we learned was that Sakadayo was hard to scale. Um, so just from my experience, in order to get Sakadayo to scale across multiple processes, we had to uh, insert something like Redis or use other libraries. And that's what we found a lot of times was we had to keep injecting more and more libraries to get the things done that we needed to achieve. And it just became this dependency nightmare. Um, we also learned we needed a better transaction store for um, catching up from offline routines. And uh, we also needed PubSub. Um, so we were just doing direct pushes and basically emitting between nodes. And what we realized was adhering to a PubSub model on a per table basis made a lot more sense. We also wanted to enable third party observers, meaning that um, not just our nodes are talking to each other, but you could have another, say like a client in a React application that was connecting to a table stream from a node and is observing what was transacting on the person table, right? And you're seeing everything that's inserting, everything that's updating, uh, deleting. And so you're seeing that all in real time, also being able to go back in time and see chunks of that stream um, as well, uh, similar to something like Kafka. And then also we need better security between our nodes. So we did a lot of bake-offs after uh, Socket.io um, and where we landed was Socket Cluster. Um, Socket Cluster was not something I was all that familiar with, um, but after researching it, I really enjoyed the, how lightweight it was, how it scaled. It was a very flexible framework that we could put our own custom logic into and also do that deterministic um, connections between nodes. So maybe node one is gonna push the person table node two and receive a config table from node two and then node two is going to continue to push on that person table up to node three um, and so there's a little up there's some down and uh, our admin the administrators of the system get to choose how that all works out um, also socket cluster has built-in connection management broker management channel management message handling um, all those things, you don't need to build that yourself. It handles 
all that for you. It'll dynamically build channels for you when they're no longer in use. It'll just garbage collect them. So you don't need to worry about disposing, things like that. Um, also managing, you know, if you've spawned up multiple instances of a socket cluster server, um, having an underlying broker that knows um, even though something, when something is going to publish out, socket one on uh, process one might need that data as well as socket two on process two. So that broker also handles making sure that every subscriber reaches, receives the data that they expect. Um, also, there's a big uh, client ecosystem, which is really big for us, because even though we use Node.js, not all of our clients are on JavaScript. It's, again, across the board, depending on what their internal tools are. Um, and also looking at socket cluster use cases, the obvious is chat, um, really intriguing was blockchain, and they're actually funded by um, a blockchain company called Coinify, I think. Um, there's also gaming use cases using socket cluster and then us as a distributed database. Um, so why did we choose socket cluster? I covered a lot of this before, primarily, you know, Node.js and a well-supported library. Um, John DeBoy, who primarily manages this, is really active in the community, um, does consistent updates. He's always refining the project. Um, and in the last year, he's made some huge leaps in that technology where going from uh, an old callback approach, he's made everything fully promise-based, but then on top of that, he made all of the listeners, these async iterators that are event-based um, that uh, enables you to have all your messages delivered in the order that was sent. So you have that transactional integrity that's coming through. Um, and then, like I said before, there is like easy, it was easy to add custom logic. Um, so how do we use it? Uh, we use it as a distributed data replication framework. And so the big thing was moving our um, Socket.io, Socket.io logic was really tightly coupled into our core database logic. And so we wanted to run this as a sidecar in the Socket cluster that was really easy because it runs as a separate server. And now once I get into the code, I'll show you all that. Um, so that allows us to have every HarperDB node be its own message broker. Um, to be able to handle its own communication between nodes, doing that pub sub. Um, also, uh, Socket Cluster has JWT built in with off. Um, so there's just base security, also supports SSL between nodes. Um, so that way we can verify that no external uh, connectors are coming in that shouldn't be part of the network. And then, like I had mentioned, in the future, we're going to extend this out to all core Harper DB operations, not just our CRUD operate or our uh, insert update delete and schema uh, transfer. Um, so that was a lot of words. Um, let's look at some code because um, I think that's what really helps people visualize what was it that we were trying to achieve um, and how did we get there. So um, let me shout out. The repo. Let me get there. So, if anyone wants to follow along, I just, uh, oh, I sent that not to everyone. There we go. Awesome. So um, just looking at uh, the sample project that I created for this. Um, so really what I'm trying to demonstrate in a really simple manner is having multiple nodes spin up, have them connect to each other and uh, send some data, not send others. Uh, so do data replication between nodes with the pub sub and then also execute um, reads. And so collect that data through an RPC across all those nodes using WebSockets through Socket Cluster. Um, so just like a little bit of a code overview, uh, we have a classes directory. This is where our 
primary business logic lives. Um, have some simple data. So again, this is a real simple use case. To start with, we just have a user's CSV, and this is what I'm using for my janky authentication. Um, you know, a bunch of node modules. I included a Postman collection in here for anyone that's interested later in what the requests look like to a REST server that's part of this project. Um, and then we have some uh, clients and servers that I'll get to in a bit. So the meat of the project, um, just jumping in, is um, we're going to start with looking at creating a socket cluster server. And it's very, very easy. Just import the socket cluster server library, um, instantiate an HTTP server, and then you attach that to a socket cluster server. In this case, I'm not supplying any options uh, for the server. Again, it's really basic, but you can do a lot of uh, more fine tuning. So defining ping times, timeouts, uh, things like that, it goes on and on. Their documentation is also very excellent. Um, define what port the HTTP server should be running on. Um, so very basic, just getting the, the servers spun up, up and running. Um, so where it gets a little bit more interesting is when we get into handling listeners and middleware. And like I mentioned before, Socket Cluster has a really unique pattern where all of their listeners and all of their data handlers are these async uh, iterators. And so what that looks like is exhibited with uh, the listeners here. So looking at how I'm uh, initializing a disconnect listener, I am calling it, but I'm not really waiting it for, for it to do anything because it's gonna spin up and then sit there. And this consumer here, it's based off of the SC server listener on disconnection. So this would, in a more event-based pattern, be an on event, um, but they changed this pattern to be an iterator. Um, so this just runs waiting in the background of the process. And when something is put onto that, uh, that listener, it'll then execute this iterator here. Um, so disconnect listener, we're just listening for when a socket disconnects and why this is all pretty basic stuff. Okay, the server's ready, we have some errors. Um, and then here, what I'm doing Doing is creating a connection listener. So on connect event of an external client connection, I'm going to execute some custom code. So what we can do here is listen for remote procedure calls. And this is how I'm invoking authentication between the server and a client. And so what will happen is the connection will establish. And then on the client, I can invoke this login uh, listener. And all I have to do is over in my socket cluster client, when I connect here, so again, the patterns are very similar over on the client. It also has a connect listener, very similar to the server. Um, but what I can do here is I listen for the connect event, just like the server is listening as well. And then I can invoke some promises. Here, I'm invoking this login event on the server and I'm passing it my credentials. Over on the server, it's listening for anyone that's uh, trying to invoke that login. Uh, we're expecting the data from that request to be uh, credentials. I'm doing some real basic validation uh, and then my janky pull the users from the CSV file. Um, if I authenticate, I can set an auth token um, and mark it as success and continue. Because remember, this is an iterator. And so I have to tell it to continue or it'll get stuck. Um, so that's one really key thing here is making sure that you next on to the next thing or making sure that you exit out from your lock inside the iterator. Um, I can also pass an error back to um, that client as well, just telling it a custom error message. So then one more thing for now that I wanna look at inside the server is uh, creating middleware. Um, and so here, 
their middleware is really based on some like broad topics and then there's types that then drill down into some more specific actions that you can create logic around. So um, there's four, I'm only gonna remember three right now. There's an inbound middleware that you can set. Um, there's an outbound, so any messages that are coming in are for the inbound middleware, any messages that are going out are for the outbound middleware. There's also the handshake. Um, so that's when a connection is be just being established between the client and the server. Um, there's one more, uh, I'll have to look at the docs to let you know. Um, so again, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just uh, binding a async function here. But again, um, it acts very similar to those listeners from before. Um, but in this case, this generates a middleware stream. Again, it's an iterator, it's async. Um, and each type of middleware has its own uh, data that is assigned to this action. Uh, inbound always has a type, it will always have uh, a reference to the socket connection. It will have uh, the data that was passed in. Um, it has a few other things as well. So the things that you can work with on an inbound are subscribe, transmit, publish in, uh, invoke, transmit, authenticate. Um, and what I'm doing here, is, so I have this case statement that just falls through um, and just falls into making sure that the socket is authenticated. So if a socket that's unauthenticated tries to subscribe to a channel, we stop it or transmit or try to publish in, we block that. We don't want them doing that. I do allow them to execute and invoke. That's really important for um, uh, the login listener. That is an invoke that's executing and then also authenticate. We want that to occur pre-auth as well. Um, and then I've just added a custom if statement here. So if this is published in and we have some data, um, we can get into this later, but this is where when data is published in across the socket, uh, across the cluster, I actually am calling the function to write that data to disk. Um, but I block it here because I don't want this message to continue down to uh, what's called the exchange. And the exchange is basically the terminus of publish in and the beginning of publish out. Um, so I wanna stop it from hitting the exchange because I'm gonna, one, I wanna make sure that this data transacts on my server and two, um, if I allow this to go through and then I publish it out later, um, all of the subscribers are going to get double messages. So we want to stop that as well. Um, so one other thing real quick, there's a lot of other code in here that everyone can look at um, later. Um, so like I said, we have our listeners, our middleware. Um, one other thing that I'm doing here is creating a REST server. Um, so I pass in the so a reference to the socket cluster server, also the HTTP server that was used for the socket cluster server. I'm gonna reuse it for the REST server here. I'm lazy, I don't wanna manage multiple ports. So I'm gonna use the same port for my REST server as the WebSocket server. Um, so, you know, I instantiate Express, everyone knows Express. Um, and then here you can see that um, I'm just forwarding all the HTTP requests. And I'm just applying them against my REST application. Um, and then I build some routes. Um, we'll get into these routes as um, I go through the demo. I did a lot of talking. Let's actually run this thing. Um, so first thing we'll do is we'll spin up an instance of an SC server. Um, if you remember that server took two attributes, it was the port I want the server to run on and a unique name. Um, so I'm gonna run this. Awesome, SE server is ready. Uh, and then we're gonna run a test client. So again, this is not your node connection. This is just to show, hey, we can connect and we can make things happen. Um, so for the client, we need to specify the host it's on, the port, and again, just a unique name for the client. The other thing I'm doing here is I'm automatically just gonna subscribe to a channel. I'm gonna subscribe to the dog channel. At HarperDB, we love our dogs. Um, cool. Awesome, socket is off. So we are connected and authenticated. Um, so now um, let's write some data. So I created a REST endpoint 
here um, called the channel post handler. Um, so the route is right, and then you specify the channel as a gram. And all this will do is just write um, to a CSV file uh, with the name of the channel, and each server will have its own unique folder. So that's just showing how uh, data isolation between nodes, um, since I'm not doing full scale like, uh, multi, -ser multi server setup here. So my server is running on port 1000, and I'm going to write Kato to the database. So I write it. Um, I also have another endpoint that can give me the data that I wrote to the um, endpoint. Um, so just like the dog channel, or the right um, route, I can specify what channel I want to read against. So I'm going to read from the dog channel. So it's telling me I wrote Kato. And we can also see on my client here, um, it received, since it subscribed to dog, it also received that data. So not super exciting. Um, so let's add another server to the mix and start replicating some data. Awesome. So we've got test server two it's running on port 2000. It has a unique name of server two. And then you can also see in data here, um, Server has the dog file, the CSV file, it is in there. All right. So we need the nodes to connect to each other in order for us to do some communication. We also need them to decide whether they're going to publish um, or subscribe or both. Um, so what I'm going to do here is server one, which is on 1000, is going to uh, connect to server two on port 2000. And we're going to do full data replication on the dog channel, and we're only going to publish the person. Um, so looking, let's just execute that. And then server two, you can see it has a new socket connected to it. And then on, over on my first server, it's saying socket is connected, socket is off, just like the client used. So when we look at um, my server code here. Right, so I have a function here called connect to server. And so that rest endpoint actually, since I have ties between my um, rest server and my socket cluster server, I can also reference the class functions uh, in both, which is real handy. Um, still have that isolation of code. Um, so here I'm just saying, hey, I want you to connect to a server. I instantiate a new socket cluster client, just like I did for that standalone client. Um, I'm also tracking the outbound connections. Um, socket cluster itself will track its own connections, like if you do just a straight subscribe, but this is a little bit outside of the norm for socket cluster, so I have to do some manual work here. Uh, then I iterate that subscriptions array that I defined in my uh, body here. And so if I'm publishing, I need to do a little bit of work and watch the local exchange because I need this separate socket client to observe that channel and push that data over to the other node. So I've got some code here that does just that. It creates another iterable against the exchange. And like I said, the exchange is the terminus of the publish in right before the publish out. So that's where the, the actual, um, if it passes the middleware, this is where it ends up is on the exchange. So I'm watching that. Um, I'm also setting some originator data on, I'm adding some metadata to the data itself, and that's to avoid loopback. And so let's say I have that topology of a square at the very least, where there ends up being a connect the dots back to the original node that may have transacted and we just keep push, 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 push. I don't want node one to receive that same data that it sent out to begin with. Um, we could get data duplication or at the very least extra network traffic. So I'm tracking that. Um, I also check to make sure that the node I'm sending to isn't on the originator list. And then I, on that client, I do a transmit publish. So I push it out to that other node and then that hits its uh, inbound middleware 
and goes through that same flow that we saw before. All right, so let's break that connection. Actually, I think I already did. Yeah, let me restart these. Awesome. So we have our connection. So like I said, we're doing full data replication between uh, node one and node two. So obviously if I write penny to node one, well, I better hope I find it in node one and then I expect it on node two and vice versa writing it to node two. It's on node two. And then also on node one, um, right there. Uh, so then the other uh, subscription that we did was only pushing from node one to node two, so on the person channel. So on node two, writing to person, I'm gonna put old Jerry here in node two. So there we got Jerry, and then Jerry will not be on node one. So making sure that we have that deterministic data sharing, just like I talked about, like what we are trying to pattern in HarperDB is deciding what data we want to go where. And the use case for that is pretty common for our clients, and especially in an edge scenario, um, where you've got, uh, near, uh, you've got devices that are in, say, a manufacturing plant, they're collecting temperature data, um, and it's just firing off multiple sensor readings per second you really only care about when that goes out of range. And so once it goes out of range, then the command and control really wants to know about that. What device is increasing in temperature? What's that in temperature increase rate looked like? So then pushing that data into a separate table that then would push up to a command and control, but the raw data is sitting only on that edge node and is tailing um, and basically a time to live for that data and that way you're only sharing the data that really makes sense, that's really important to your customers. And that's what I'm, uh, one thing I'm modeling here. Um, so one other thing that I thought would be fun to add here is I'm just gonna spin up one more server. So I'm gonna spin up server three. And I am gonna connect Three to one. And I'm just going to subscribe. One person. Cool. All right, so the other thing that I decided would be fun here is creating um, uh, a remote procedure call between all nodes that are connected to the node that I'm on, uh, like so node one or node two. Um, I just wanna make sure that that data pushed. Awesome, so cool guy pushed to two or to three. So what I wanna do is do a read all on the person channel. And what that will do is everyone that's connected to one, we're gonna push out a remote procedure call to every single node to look at each file um, that we have in this data directory. So you can see server has just cool guy, server two has Jerry and cool guy, uh, server three doesn't even have person, um, but I wanna have a procedure that basically executes a query against all my nodes and say, give me what you got. Use case for that could be, I'm trying, to, I've been offline for a bit. I'm trying to catch back up, see what I missed before I start transacting again. 
Um, so if I do this real here for person, I can see again empty object for uh, server three because that has no uh, person record uh, CSV file. Server two has some of the data, and server has just that one record that I had, that I had shared with it. Um, so then, real quick at the end. Um, I will show you that code and then we'll kick it off to questions. I can turn over the, oh yeah. So what I did here, um, so in, uh, I have a, another route for handling the um, get all. And so I have a channel get all handler. And what that does is it looks at the SC server, it's the clients, and so socket cluster natively with a subscribe will add you to its client list. Um, for the manually added connections that um, I just created, I have a map on that class, that SC server class called outbound clients. Um, so I can then track these manual connections that I have between nodes. Um, so then I can get a list of all those sockets and then execute um, or invoke a function against all those servers. That function is called get channel data. Which is right here. So every single server will receive this, a call to this function. They'll call back up to the rest server call get channel data, they'll fetch their data if they have it from uh, the CSV file. Um, so it's real simple call to get the uh, data from the file and then they each return it back. Um, and since I have this all as a promise all, I'm gonna wait for all the results. There is a automatic timeout of 10 seconds on an invoke across from a client um, to a server or vice versa. So after 10 seconds, if someone doesn't return, it'll time out and I'll just get an empty object back for that um, record, um, get my results back and that's it. And really uh, the awesome thing too is like, I'm calling out to this node to get its own data, to node one to get its own data and then nodes two and three, they're all executing in parallel. That call executes in seven milliseconds, um, whereas if I just call that just against node three, that's also seven seconds. So you can see the scale of parallelization of getting that data. So what that also shows is fragmenting your data across multiple nodes can help you use commodity hardware to increase performance um, and uh, not have these giant monolithic servers. Um, so that is it for me. Um, I did a lot of talking. I appreciate everyone hanging in there. Um, oh, one other thing um, before I take your questions. Um, just real quick, HarperDB, um, we have uh, a, a cloud offering. If you wanna check it out, you can sign up for an instance for free. I think we also have a coupon code. Um, this is what our studio looks like. It's totally um, self-service. Um, so if you're interested, you can go check it out. If you're not interested, you can tell me I'm a bad salesperson and I agree. <laughs> um, so that's uh, really the last thing. Um, so now, I'll turn it over to Q&A. And like I said, that was um, a lot in a very short period of time. And uh, so please go check out the repo if you're interested in learning more about the framework. It's been hugely helpful for us. Um, you know, that's the code that I showed is not exactly what we're doing, but it's like the pattern is there and that shows just sort of like the paradigm that we were um, trying to achieve. Hey, Kyle, it's Kaylin. Hey, Kaylin. <laughs> um, I did see a question in the chat. I don't know if you noticed that guy. Um, oh, from Chad, yeah. It from, yeah, it was from a little bit back, but. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I have never actually seen that before either. And when I first started working with their listeners, um, I was a little bit of WTF because um, their code examples uh, aren't all, don't make it very clear how to make it modular. Um, I really struggled with that at first. Like, how do I make this modular? So um, the creators of Socket Cluster also created their, they made this themselves and he calls them writable consumable streams. Um, I will share this here, but this is something um, of their own making. Um, so if you're interested, you can look that up. And it's also, you can use that just for yourself and you can um, you know, publish to those uh, streams yourself and use them as these async iterators. Um, it's a really interesting paradigm that he's created for himself, but not something I've seen before. Hey, Kyle. Yes. Carlos here. Nice to put a face on your name. You too. There you go. Um, got a question about the uh, the uh, socket closer implementation that you guys implemented in Harper. Are you using the the raw quote unquote and normal socket cluster or do you guys actually take that code and tweak it? Um, we have not forked it. So we're using that library as is. Um, and sort of like I showed, it's really um, flexible. And so we're using their middleware, but we're using it as a framework. We haven't forked it and done our own magic to it. We're using it as is. Are you a contributor to the Socket Cluster project? Uh, no, <laughs> I should be. I, I've contributed to a few other libraries um, that we consume, but I have not had a, an opportunity to use this. Like personally for myself, I usually contribute when I find a bug. And so if you find it, you fix it. Um, and I have not, I mean, they definitely have bugs. I'm not saying they don't have bugs, um, but I personally have not found anything um, and uh, everything that I've needed to accomplish that framework I've been able to do. All right. Um, and they also have, um, they use Gitter, which is like a, a messaging board and their community is very active. Uh, I've used that pretty extensively to get answers to questions um, that I've had. Um, so they have a pretty nice community behind that framework. And it's been around for quite a while as well. Um, I think he started this project at least five years ago. Okay. All right. Ask Chrissy one more question for you. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, question about your, your hardware implementation. Um, can you can you just spend a minute just talking about how how do you work out data distribution uh, specifically if, uh, for cases that you are not interested in basically just saving all the data between in, in all nodes, right? But you are really would like to store all your data in between a cluster of whatever, 10, 15, 20 nodes or whatnot. Harper, Harper supports that? And if so, are you basically using the same, sub, sort of like the same pattern that you talk about here? Yeah, so it would be very similar to some of those patterns that I talked about earlier. And we're using the same framework. Um, and that really ends up being uh, up to our, our customers, like how they want to distribute it. And it's really common, again, going back to what you're talking about, I may, have like turned it around in my head, but what you're talking about really sounds to me a lot like um, a manufacturing scenario where you mm -hmm. have all these little edge nodes that roll up to a gateway. And so right. you've got um, local, uh, local store that rolls up to regional store that then may roll up um, to uh, like national store and then maybe there's like a global. Um, and there could be a distribution of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and so spreading those all out are really up to our customers. And so we're not dictating any patterns for them. And that's where being able to create their own custom topology has really been helpful for our customers. And then also saying this table, I want to push up um, the, the temperature aggregate table, 
but the temperature raw, I'm going to leave local and it's still mm -hmm. on the same node. Um, and I'm going to just tail off that uh, temperature raw table. And because for the most part, it lives for an hour, that's fine. I can dump it and keep going. Um, but that um, temperature aggregate or temperature alert, we could say too, right? So um, showing trend lines um, of an increase over a threshold or something like that, that would then need to go to a command and control so that they are alerted um, through data that something bad is happening and they can send out a tech um, so that they can get ahead of, you know, an outage inside their uh, manufacturing plant. Uh, last question, and I promise to mute myself. Uh, <laughs> a, sales, a sales pitch for you. Uh, why Harper and not Cockroach or, or any alternative? Yeah, so um, very easy to use, super lightweight, uh, NoSQL and SQL in one. Um, uh, so you can do your data analytics, full analytics with aggregates, table joins, things like that without trying to, needing to um, inject your NoSQL data store and a relational data store. Um, and we've also done benchmarks against MongoDB um, and we've outperformed MongoDB and benchmarks. Uh, and I think, I can't remember, there's a couple others that we've outperformed. Like, so outperform some traditional NoSQL databases. Um, and again, you know, uh, uh, you know, like it also comes down to making sure you're using the right tool for the job. But what we built HarperDB to be is a Swiss Army knife for developers um, that can help you deal with your big data without having a lot of overhead and headaches. All right. Thank you, you're welcome. Any other questions for Kyle? All right. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for that talk. That was super informative and, and really awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having uh, me. I, you know, I just appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it was great having you out here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for stopping by and watching. Um, you all are, you know, what causes this meetup to still, you know, to still happen month after month. Um, we're looking forward to having uh, uh, Chad uh, on next week, uh, so next week, next month, sorry. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'm going to get this, uh, this talk up onto YouTube and uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you all know where that link is when it's up probably sometime this weekend. And with that, um, let's all have a great rest of the month and uh, take care of ourselves and stay safe. You too. Thank you.